This is the R Podcast, Episode 11, Reproducible Analysis, Part 1. Hello everyone, and welcome to the R Podcast. This is the podcast where we give those of you who are new to statistical computing, or those of you that have experience in using other statistical computing software, to learn about the use of R in order to get your data analysis done. I'm your host, Eric Nance, and it's uh, great to be back and kicking off this uh, second season of the R Podcast. And definitely for those of you of uh, coming back from listening to previous episodes thanks a lot for uh, tuning in and obviously it's been a long time coming to get this season started but i'm really looking forward to the content we have and actually this season is going to have what i would consider kind of a theme around it and this theme is going to be called reproducible analysis though some of you may have heard this term before and some of you may be wondering what is this Well, I'm going to take this episode to give kind of a high level of what, in my opinion, reproducible analysis really means and how this next season will have, will be covering many different aspects of it in individual episodes. So this will be part one of a multi-part series. Not sure how many there will be, but I have some, you know, really some exciting, you know, topics lined up for this and I'm really looking forward to getting this started. And usually this is the time where I give kind of some updates about kind of the R podcast site or other kind of administrative things. I am going to save that for later in the episode because it will tie in directly with some of the things I have in store for uh, feedback and everything. So with that, let's go ahead and get to the main topic, reproducible analysis, an introduction. Okay, so I've been talking about this term reproducible analysis, and there is a lot of content online that kind of describes this, and they may also use a different terminology called uh, reproducible research, but they're all basically the same thing. And I'll give a high level first of how this ties in with R, both in the past and what things we have capable of for R in the future when it comes to reproducible research. So first, at a high level, what is this uh, term reproducible analysis all about? So let me take you to a pretty common situation for those of you that have been, you know, working in statistics or any other type of data analysis and kind of go through kind of a a few steps that you might go in, in your analysis. So of course, you may be working for a client or you may be doing this on your own and you've defined your problem of interest. You've been able to either collect or, you know, find some data to help you, you know, solve this problem or look into it. You've been able to do your research and find an appropriate statistical method to um, answer your question of interest. You might call that hypothesis, depending on what kind of research you're doing. And you'll write your analysis to be done. And of course, I'm going to assume you're using R to do this. So you've found either in base R or maybe one of the add-on packages, ways for you to, uh, you know, import your data, clean your data up, and then go ahead and run the statistical methodologies you've you've, uh, chosen to actually get an answer to your hypothesis of interest. And then you're going to take those results that you get from R You're going to either, say, put them in a report for a a client. Maybe you'll put it in some kind of slide deck to show clients in like a presentation format. Or this could all be for a manuscript that you want to publish later on. So 
what typically happens is whenever we do an analysis in a statistical computing package such as R or any of the other ones, maybe SPSS, SAS, what have you, you'll get those results and then most likely what will happen is you'll have to basically copy those results from the analysis package and paste them into whatever report or presentation or other document you're creating to um, you basically document all of your results. And if it is, say, for a manuscript, this is obviously all going to be tied in with the whole research problem definition, everything like that. But my point in all, my point in all this is typically what we would assume we'd have to do is basically manually copy these results from our computing statistical computing package into whatever document we're producing to hold these results. And actually, I could even say document could be defined even in a different way. Perhaps you want to post these results online as well for others to share. Perhaps the you know blog you have or maybe some other means. And I'll kind of touch on some ways we can do that shortly. But just this process of getting the results and then having to copy them over into whatever what I would say product you're producing, like I said, if it's a document or a web page or anything like that. You know, first of all, if you have a very comprehensive analysis, because can be rather tedious, obviously, depending on how many results you're getting. And the other thing is, is that this is a human type process, right? You have to manually copy everything and then paste it into your product. And of course, we strive to be, you know, 100% correct all the time. But who knows, maybe you've accidentally copied the wrong p-value in one in one sentence. Maybe you've copied the wrong uh, summary statistics or the wrong variables, things like that. In other words, human error can play a role. And one other aspect of this is your code and your um, results in this product you're producing are somewhat separate, right? Some may put the code as like an appendix or some may not even put the code in at all. But it's they're kind of separate beings, your, your code and then whatever results you got from it within your uh, finished product. So... That's kind of the way I used to do things, especially when I even first learned R, whenever I was learning in graduate school and I had maybe some homework or I was doing some consulting uh, for some clients. I would get my results in R, I'd get my plots, whatever have you, and I would paste them in into some kind of word processing document or some other summary, maybe a set of slides, what have you. Well, as I was getting to know R, I got um, to know a capability that was basically built right into it that totally shifted how this process would go. So built into R, ever since I believe um, the version that was produced in uh, 2002 or 2003, give or take, there has been a, a piece of functionality called S-Weave, some might call it Sweave, and what is this? Well, this is actually a um, product of what's called literate programming. And I'm not going to define that very detailed here, but here's a high level of what it means. It kind of means that when you're producing, say, a report or whatever kind of product that has results of an analysis, that it should have your code that actually did it tied in very directly with the narrative around your process of running that code and getting the result. And anything like copy, pasting, things like that should be kept at a minimum. And ideally, that your code would in essence be able to be run inside the actual report you're producing. So where does S-Weave play into this? So S-Weave actually ties in building what's called a R no web file, and that has an extension .rnw. And what are the contents of this type of file? Well, S-Weave is tied in directly with the LaTeX document uh, typesetting software. 
Some of you may have heard of LaTeX before. Some of you may be thinking, why am I talking about some kind of product that you would wear gloves for? Well, LaTeX is actually a very comprehensive and I must say very powerful document typesetting package where unlike say a Microsoft Word type uh, word processor or LibreOffice word processor where it's well it's one of those things where it's called what you see is what you get editor so you're typing in everything you can change formatting by highlighting things making things bold but it, you're doing it kind of visually and you're able to control things kind of with all these menus all these buttons etc well LaTeX is more of for lack of a better term, a programming way to make your document. It's basically using a set of kind of functions, you might call them macros or things like that, combined with much like R, these kind of add-on packages inside it to basically control every aspect of the document you're producing from, say, a programming type level. And oftentimes you'll see LaTeX used for uh, dissertations, actually, especially in the science field. And I'm one of them. I used LaTeX for my dissertation, and it was really up to that point I'd had a basic um, interaction with LaTeX, but that was my first real foray into it. And like I said, LaTeX is very powerful. And I will get to this a little later on, but there is so much inside it there's quite a learning curve with it but let me finish my point about sweave so sweave what happens is you make this dot r and w r no web file and inside it it looks almost exactly like a typical latex document file which has an extension dot latex l a t e x but then instead of what you would think traditionally where you're writing this, uh, we'll call it a manuscript, you're writing like your introduction, your methods, what you're doing, and then you get to your results. Whereas in the beginning of this uh, segment, I was saying how we usually would have to copy and paste our results into the document of choice. Here in this RNW file, you actually put in the R code that you use to produce that particular result you're wanting to put in the report and you put this code inside of what are called chunks so like code chunks that are kind of delimited inside the document by a certain syntax and we'll be going over kind of all the details of this in, in future episodes in this series I'm just talking more at a high level of how this works but what's interesting is once you've Put in all of your chunks of code where these results are supposed to be and you finish you know your file creation so you have everything in there what happens is within r you can compile this r and w file with the function s weave capital s and a lowercase w e a v e and you feed in the argument of the file name that has everything so that we'll call it test.rnw and this function is actually going to run r for those code chunks that are inside it and then you'll get a dot latex file as a result that has the what we would call the compiled r results you know maybe you did a summary table maybe you did a plot you know anything like that that is all going to be within the dot latex file and then you would do your usual um, LaTeX type functionality to basically get your finished uh, paper out of that. So you might use a command like PDF LaTeX to actually get the PDF version of that, of that report. And then there you have it. Your finished report has you know, all the text of your report itself. But then where those code chunks were in your RNW file, it actually has say a table maybe just a set of numbers or a plot as if you had already copy and pasted it in there yourself but that was done for you automatically and that in essence is what sweave is it gives you the capability of putting in your r code inside one of these latex document files 
and then being able to run that code inside it with a SWE function to get those results into an actual LaTeX file. This, up until recently, has really been one of the standards for you know, producing what we're calling reproducible analysis in, within R itself. And when I first got exposed to SWE, it was, to me, extremely powerful and something I never even dreamed that could be could be even done. It was so much easier once I, well, let me, let me phrase this a little bit. It was a concept that I've always been looking to have, but I didn't know any software that was capable of it. So I ended up using S-Weave when I wrote my dissertation. But uh, now this is the part I'll be getting at, is that there was, I would say, a really steep learning curve with the ins and outs of LaTeX itself, which, you know, that kind of comes with the powerful capabilities of LaTeX. You have to kind of learn a lot to take full advantage of these things. And, you know, it, it, there was certainly a lot of effort, but in the end, I was quite happy with my dissertation as a result. But s gives our users that capability. And now I'll take you to what's been happening recently. So what happened recently is... Um, one of the uh, leading members of the R community these days, um, his name is uh, Ihua Sia. And I probably, I probably butchered the pronunciation of his name, so I, I apologize, Ihua, if you're listening to this. Uh, in uh, 2011, I was, you know, surfing R bloggers like usual, just kind of seeing what's out there. And lo and behold, I see this post linked to his uh, website about a new package called Knitter. Now, Knitter is really quite interesting, and we're going to dedicate a full episode to Knitter, you know, in, in very soon, actually, in this series. But Knitter, in essence, is taking S-Weave on a whole nother level, where the possibilities now have been wide open in terms of how you write this uh, report that you're producing. You're not, you're not tied to LaTeX anymore. Now you're going to be able to use some different input formats, and we're going to talk about all of those, but Knitter has kind of created this uh, really big buzz in the R community that has really made reproducible analysis, I would say, even more feasible, in fact, I'll say much more feasible to those that are maybe new to R and those also that are new to things like LaTeX, where now they can do this in a much I would say easier way, especially for those that are new to this um, process. Knitter has basically given this functionality back to the user for really customizing what traditionally would not be so easily customizable in S-Weave. And I've been using Knitter for quite a while now, and I have some really exciting stuff I want to share with you guys in the in the future episodes about what knitter is capable of and for those of you that are not new to knitter you've probably seen um, very excellent uh, blog posts excellent demonstrations both from the knitter website and also those in the community with their own sites of what knitter is capable of and we're going to be kind of doing a lot of those things in in this podcast and future episodes with some of the data we already have i'm going to be illustrating some of the really powerful things you can do with Knitter. But Knitter, really, to the bottom line for this episode, it's really brought reproducible analysis to the forefront within the R community that, like I said, it's really made things a lot more feasible. And the best part of all, it's getting a lot of people talking about this concept. You know, it's not like no one talked about it before because, you know, S-Weave has been around for many years. But... When as I was getting to know S Weave, it seemed like a lot of the resources about it were, you know, maybe more done in earlier days, if you will. Some there were some current resources, don't get me wrong, but it was always I was always looking to see what kind of people kind of with R now were doing with S Weave. And it was always kind of difficult to find that. But now with Knitter out there, there's just a ton, a ton of resources out there 
both kind of official knitter resources and also, like I said, the community resources around it. And it's really exciting to see this develop. So now that our, now this reproducible research or reproducible analysis is kind of at the, the forefront of a lot of the topics in the community, I want to touch on just how important this concept is and why I'm dedicating a full um, series of episodes to this topic. So one thing that's kind of close to me from a professional level in terms of the work I do um, ties in with a story that broke, um, I believe, you know, it was earlier this year, perhaps last year. And it was about a situation where because of having analyses that were not reproducible, it actually impacted people's uh, actual health, if you will. And let me explain this. And I'll preface this by saying I'll have a great link in the show notes that has all the background on this um, situation. But what happened is um, in 2006, some researchers at a Duke University, Anil Poti and Joseph Nevins, they were doing some research on lung cancer. And they had published some research findings in which they claimed that they could predict the actual course of a patient's lung cancer, i.e. the progression of the disease, based on certain what could be called biomarkers. And all you really need to know is that these are basically sets of markers that were collected from tissue samples of the patient. They were sent to a lab and they were able to quantify kind of how thousands of genes inside the patient were um, fluctuating, if you will. And they claimed that using these uh, measurements, we'll call them expression arrays, they were able to predict how the patients would, you know, worsen in their condition of lung cancer. Now, this is a huge thing because this ties into a very important topic in the kind of the health industry going on about what's called personalized medicine, where companies and organizations, you know, institutions are all doing innovative research to find what kind of treatments are best for specific, you know, patients based on certain factors. And if a treatment like using this, uh, say, sample of a biomarker could lead to an improved treatment for a patient, That is absolutely huge, especially, of course, in the field of cancer. So this research got a lot of attention. And also, uh, at Duke University, they decided to launch three uh, clinical trials based on these findings to evaluate them in more uh, larger populations. So around the time the research was really breaking, and there were at least, I believe, three manuscripts that had all these results from the the researchers, uh, Pody and Evans, um, there was a group of biostatisticians at uh, MD Anderson Cancer Center by the name of Keith Batterly and Kevin Combs, or Coombs, I may not be pronouncing that right either, that were looking at their results and basically trying to replicate it themselves. Now, in that process, they were finding, in their opinion, uh, some very critical errors in the manuscripts that were published by uh, Pody and Evans. So they contacted them and got back and forth. And apparently there were some errors corrected by the original authors. But as they were, as as, um, Batterly and Combs were diving more into this, they were finding even more issues. And to make the rest of this story kind of go to its conclusion, it turns out that the primary authors, uh, uh, Anno Poti, was... um, making fraudulent use of the data, or I I should say fabricating parts of the data, making um, totally incorrect assignments to certain key variables. And basically the results were never able to be predicted by these independent researchers. And this really started to blow up once uh, Duke um, had done an investigation. And while their primary investigation just on the research itself did not find any big errors because they were just taking in account what the primary researchers Pody and Nevin supplied to them. 
apparently there was some additional checking and they found that uh, Pody was um, fraudulent about his background, some of his, uh, his uh, degrees, whatnot, and that that basically then stopped, well, basically Pody resigned from Duke and then those uh, three clinical trials were halted for good. But in, in this case really blew up even more and um, it's just a real a real sad situation and the bottom line in all this is because the original authors had not really made available kind of how they actually did the analysis from a programming level or a code level and what kind of data they were actually using um, it really really kind of made this process of these independent researchers trying to replicate these findings a lot more difficult. And then when they did find errors, it was just a really difficult process to get a resolution to this. So this is obviously a worst case scenario that you had an author that was basically fraudulent and lying about his own background. But on top of that, the actual research had gross errors perhaps intentional, perhaps not, but I think it is a mix of both, that basically made this result look so good that this uh, prediction of a patient's uh, course in lung cancer based on these uh, biomarkers they found made it look so good. In reality, it was just basically erroneous. It was almost random. And this, you know, on the surface, if no actual human beings like in these clinical trials were involved, then it may have been just isolated to like a typical academic research problem. But because this research led directly to these three trials being launched, that's when you put other people's lives in jeopardy. And it's just, it's just really, really frustrating to see how far this went. And so, yeah, this is a worst case scenario. They never would always go like this whenever you have errors in a manuscript. But it gets to this whole point about how reproducible analysis could be very important just from in science in general, where if we are fully transparent about how we actually did the analysis and depending on the situation, maybe even sharing a form of the data that maybe has stripped away its confidential nature and whatnot, that you know, having that transparency inside the actual manuscript or report, HTML report, whatever have you, having that available would just at least give everybody in the research field that are looking in this an idea of how these things are done. And having to share those kind of things, like the code you do, do your analysis with, and at least a more detailed description of the data, and maybe that part is not feasible, but at least sharing how you did the analysis, it almost holds it to a higher standard because then if you know you're sharing an erroneous result, then the research community is going to pick up on it just like in a snap of a finger. So it's I think it's important, especially when we get to these topics of like looking at treatments of cancer or other types of real scientific breakthroughs that involve actual human lives that reproducible analysis is in my opinion very important to have now on a totally different level that obviously is not involving you know life or death situations just from my perspective reproducible analysis is also important just because if we really see an interesting you know manuscript an interesting you know web report and it's a topic we're interested in and we see they were using, say, a really novel statistical method. And you see the results they get, and they're really quite innovative. But it seems like more often than not, when I find these kind of manuscripts, well, guess what? There's no code shared or how they did it, or, you know, things like that. There's no supplemental material sometimes that at least has a code listing. And you're always kind of thinking to yourself, well, they had to do it somehow. How did they actually do it? And just... For my learning to be able to get access to that um, would be really helpful if I'm into, say, a new research area and I find a really helpful resource, but I still don't really know how they do it. 
And then you can always try contacting the author and some will get back to you and some may not. But having, you know, the code kind of shared with how these results are generated in like a novel report could be really helpful just to the community in general. And now this is obviously a big hurdle, right? Because there will be some journals or some organizations that simply will have none of this. They they will not require their authors to do something like this. So is this going to change overnight? Well, definitely not. I understand. But I'm kind of seeing some really interesting applications and ideas being brought out with the not only the R community, but the statistics community in general of how we can use kind of the newer tools offered for reproducible analysis, such as Knitter, for example, to really make research a lot more transparent. But I want to say that it's not just using a thing like Knitter alone. I think there's another really key component in this concept of reproducible analysis. And that concept is uh, version control. I believe I mentioned version control in a previous podcast, but here's where I think it ties in with, say, statistics or, you know, science in general. We, now, while we typically think of version control for things like software development, where they're making a new piece of software, and as they go through, like, different betas and alphas and into the release, um, usually in good practice, they will... You know, they will use verse control to basically have a point of restore. If, say, in an update, things go horribly wrong, they can go back and see, you know, go to a previous version that was working and then go from there. And it also is very helpful to kind of document what changes are made from version to version because there are some systems that will let you, in essence, give a detailed message every time you make a big change and you make that official. So I think this could tie in very nicely with statistics and research in general, where no matter if we're producing, say, an actual manuscript or if we're just producing something internally, if we're working in an organization or we're just doing some consulting for a client, I think it's really nice that version control could offer us a way to Basically, once we get a rough idea of how we actually carry out the analysis and develop the code to do it, to give us kind of a baseline point of where we started, but then maybe through interactions of a client or just through our own research, we realize that, oh, what if I try this method or, you know, what I did previously wasn't working well, so let me do it in a different way. That's just a very high level what you may be thinking that version control could give you kind of that trail of going from where you started with the analysis and then in certain steps as you, what I'll call commit these changes to your analysis, you'll have kind of this history of what you've done, but it's done for you kind of, well, not quite automatically because you have to commit to these changes, you know, yourself. But if you're disciplined enough, then you'll have kind of this, almost like a log of what your analysis has done. And then at the end, you can kind of see where you started and then where you finished. And of course, kind of to the point I made earlier, if you make this additional tweak to your analysis and then it just goes horribly wrong, you can always go back to what you did previously and, and basically start start from that point. Just like when we're, say, installing a new computer program or an operating system, and things just go completely haywire. If you have a backup of your system beforehand, then you can just simply go back to that point. So I think version control ties in not only from a personal level of, you know, having the history of the analysis you've done readily available and being able to go back when things go wrong, but th- this could also have great implications for when you share your research outside as well. And I'm kind of paraphrasing this from a great uh, blog post made on uh, the Simply Statistics uh, website. And they actually do a uh, Simply Statistics podcast as well that's had, a, I believe, four or five episodes, and it's really well done. I'll put a link to that in the show notes. But they kind of brought this topic up 
with this whole umbrella of reproducible analysis of, you know, sure, reproducible analysis will show the end product of, say, the code that got a certain result with the result itself, but it may not necessarily tell you how the, the researcher got there. But if version control was in play and we were able to somehow share what the researcher started with the analysis up until where they completed, then you kind of see the stages of the analysis. And to me, that would be really kind of fascinating to see how things go from where they start to where they finish for an innovative problem or an innovative uh, topic instead of just seeing the finished product itself. It's kind of like the journey is just as important as the end, if you will, or the destination. So, of course, we don't have anything that's really like this yet. But it really got me thinking that I kind of have an opportunity to do something like this on my own. And I'm not saying I'm doing this for like a manuscript or anything, but I'm thinking given this uh, data set I have with that NHL data, where up until this point, you just see me do some basic uh, visualizations with ggplot2, I'm really interested to kind of try out this kind of reproducible analysis, both from what we'll do with the knitter package, but also with the version control that I've already kind of started, and how we go through these different stages of analysis kind of showing that trail from start to finish. I think it might be kind of interesting to see how that goes in a project like this where it's, of course, statistics, right? You're doing some kind of analysis on data. I'm not developing software. I'm just looking at interesting trends in this uh, NHL data, and I'm going to come at it with some specific questions in mind before I start. And then through version control and putting all of this on GitHub, I'll be able to show kind of how I go through these different stages of the analysis. So there, were, there will be definitely one episode in this series dedicated to how we do version control in R and how that will tie nicely with kind of sharing this, you know, to a community of researchers or just the community in general. So I'm really excited to, to talk about that in the very near future. So... I think um, another important part of reproducible analysis will come into play where I've kind of been talking about when researchers kind of do this on their own, but I think this is also just as important when we talk about collaboration. And not only with uh, collaboration with respect to using, say, Knitter to do things, but also with version control as well, where if you have a team of researchers all working from this... Uh, one big uh, what we'll call repository and each of them kind of maybe doing different parts of analysis or different parts of the topic but then being able to share all this kind of in real time and being able to share their changes with the other researchers in a robust way I think having these kind of tools available can really make collaboration a lot easier and frankly even a lot more fun than maybe it's been in the past where we didn't have this technology readily available to apply it in this setting. So I'll be talking about how we do collaboration in this series as well and how all this will kind of tie together. And the last part of this um, introduction I want to talk about is um, more so from a reporting level in terms of how we present results. So as we use R and we get to know R to do various statistical analyses, of course, there will be some functions that we use that will give us maybe some more terse output than we, what we might get from another package. Or what we want to do is we want to kind of clean up that output we get from the console and make it a really nice format into whatever product we're producing. So while this isn't necessarily linked to reproducible analysis, I think in terms of collaboration with a community and not to mention making a really polished result for whoever your um, your customer is in this case, that there are some really interesting packages in R that will kind of translate this output you're getting from the R console into some really nice formats that you can put in not only something like a manuscript in like a PDF file 
or, or even a word processing file, but also something that's optimized for the web as well. So I found a few packages that I'll be highlighting that can really make that presentation of these uh, different summaries you get from R really nice inside whatever product you're producing. And there will be one package that's kind of specific to getting these results into either a format for LaTeX or a format for HTML. And there will be other packages that kind of, what I'll call, transform the summary into a really concise and, I would say, a nice standard for how those results are presented that might be definitely applicable, say, in an industry where you're doing these analyses a bunch of times and you want like a template for how these re results are going to be reported. There will be a package that I'll highlight that kind of gets you started in that way. And then there will be another package that kind of gives you this nice um, combination of the statistics summary and also putting in like visualizations with it into one interesting uh, table summary. And that package I'll be highlighting as well. So I think that that will be another key aspect is how we present these results that we're getting to really convey the message in an effective way and not to mention make the end product a really clean presentation, if you will. And it will be, that will be another key component of this series. So as you can see, we've got a lot of avenues to explore here. And while this episode, I didn't really dive into the technical details of any of them, I wanted this episode to be more of a reference point as we start this uh, reproducible analysis series to kind of launch all the kind of interesting episodes we have later on that are dedicated to specific aspects of this whole, this whole um, area, this whole process, if you will. So I definitely am excited to share all this with you, and I definitely hope that you'll stay tuned in for the next episodes in this series to see where this goes, and of course to get your feedback along the way. As, as, as you've seen um, in past episodes, I really enjoy getting your feedback, and I think it'll add nicely to this series as well. So that kind of covers the main topic here. Let's um, next dive in to our listener feedback. Message for you, son. All right, so this listener feedback, first of all, like this episode in general, it's a long time coming, and I've tried to reply to all of you, but if I, I know I have some feedback I haven't gotten to back yet personally, and I'll definitely do that. Um, I first want to highlight a piece of feedback I got from a listener named John, and John writes... Could you post a direct download link for this screencast? And he's referring to the screencast about ggplot2. I prefer to download rather than stream the screencast. Also, it looks like your forums are being spammed. Perhaps your Linux guys can offer you some advice on controlling this. Thanks, John. Well, John, uh, <laughs> yeah, I'll first touch the easy one and I'll touch on the, the big issue. Um, I will definitely put a download links for the screencast in whether it's in the direct post of that screencast or if it's in another page that just has where you can download these directly. I tried to do that once before and for whatever reason the download link was never showing up. But I will absolutely put that in because I know from experience as well it can be just as nice to have the file downloaded just like with this podcast itself so you can play it whenever you want without having to download it again. So I will definitely do that. So when John sent me this message, um, I had not been on the forums that I made in, quite, in a little while, unfortunately. And when I got there, I noticed that there was one particular user that had posted about 3,500 posts, and they were all, of course, spam. They were spam, like advertising, spam, whatever. It made me all practically nauseous because, you know, for, for those of you that I haven't told before, and I don't think I mentioned it before, but this, uh, the R podcast site, of course, that's r podcast.org, is powered by WordPress, which is arguably the most popular blogging software out there. And the way you can customize WordPress is via these what are called plugins. 
you can think of it kind of like how the Firefox browser has plugins to make things more extendable. Well, in order to get those forums started, I had had a plugin called uh, BB Press, which basically powers the way those forums are laid out. Now, of course, I knew that when I opened the forums up for registration that there was always a possibility that I could get people that would spam it. So I had at least three plugins in place to control these uh, spammers from getting onto the site at all. And hence, I was implementing what's called the, the CAPTCHA system or the reCAPTCHA system. That's the thing where when you register for a site and ask you to type like a set of words or characters and it looks like it's from this really weird graphic, that's what that system's for because it's built primarily to stop these spammers from even getting onto your, from getting registered on your site to begin with. I had had at least two of those in place, or I believe three of those. I'd had another plugin that would try and stop these spam messages from going onto the site if those users had somehow gotten on regi- gotten registered for the site. Well, as as John saw, those didn't work, and that was much to my dismay. And so what I had to do is I had to basically stop registration on the site. And it took me over two weeks to basically get all those messages eliminated because apparently it's really taxing on the system behind WordPress where it's basically a database to get rid of all those messages in mass. And I had to do everything kind of very slow, get rid of them, and it was just a complete nightmare. Um, So the good news is, is that they're gone. That user has definitely been eliminated from the site. Now, the bad news is, is that I have not been able to get any support from the WordPress kind of plugin community on how to fix this problem. I've done a bunch of research on it, but all the forums about it have had no real clear answers. And so I've had to make a decision at this time it's rather unfortunate for me to say this, but I'm afraid I'm going to have to shut those forums down because if I can't have a way to prevent those spammers from getting onto the site, I can't risk, um, first of all, the site itself being compromised and also any of the users who are, of course, legitimate having any of their um, issues or their posts, their content compromised because of these spammers. So until I find a better solution to this, um, I'm going to have to hold off on registrations to the forums for now. And like I said, I, I really apologize for that. But as I was researching this and I was listening to some other podcasts just in my daily routine, I did get wind of another system that perhaps could work better. So by the time this is released, I hope to have this off the ground but I'm going to implement a, an external service to get um, kind of user-generated feedback that all of us can benefit from that will be what the forums are trying to do, but just in a different way. This uh, system is based on what's called Reddit. You may have used Reddit before. It's kind of like a way for people to share stories that they find online or their own kind of content and different users can basically vote that content up or down depending on you know how popular it is. So there have been some podcasts I listened to that use this for their feedback, um, and I'm going to try it out because I think it might be. First of all, it should get it should prevent any of those darn spammers from getting on there, and second, I think it'll, it'll be a nice way to kind of consolidate all the forum topics into one place. So that that site can be found at the URL links.r-podcast.org. And you will have to register for it. And unfortunately, I couldn't carry over the existing forum registrations onto that. So I do apologize for that. But I, I think this could be a really interesting way for all of, all of our listeners out there that have First of all, if they see an interesting story about R that they would like me to cover, 
go ahead and put a post on the Reddit page with, say, a link to that story. So the, first of all, I can see that and I can definitely take a look and definitely share it with the rest of the audience, but also just having some real time you know, feedback with the rest of the community, I think would be really interesting. And not only like sharing stories about R itself, but also if um, I start a thread about kind of a particular episode, we can share our feedback in that way as well. So I will um, get this off the ground. By the time you listen to this, it should be all ready. And I'll try and put some things I'm finding interesting on that site as well. They may or may not end up in the in the podcast itself, but it might be a nice way to interact with the community out there. So I realize this is a big shift in how we're doing this, and it'll take some time to really get this off the ground. But I'm really excited for what it can what it can offer. And judging by what I've seen in the other podcasts that are using this, it's actually a very powerful way of providing feedback and direct response to that feedback. So. Hopefully that will work out much better than the forums did. But I do, before I close out this part of the feedback, I want to thank all the, the all the listeners out there that joined the forums and posted some really nice uh, content on there. And it was really nice to interact with all of you. And I do apologize that we can't keep that part of it going. But I definitely hope that you will migrate over to the... Uh, subreddit we're calling it for the R podcast and that we can share our, our feedback that way as well. So that's about all I want to say about that piece of it but kind of closely tied to that in this layoff I've had between the last episode and this episode I made some upgrades to the R podcast.org site behind the scenes. Um, it's basically using a new version of the operating system that it's based on and a lot of security updates have been posted, and plus it's a new version of WordPress, which should make things even faster than before. So hopefully things are working just as before, if not a little better. But if you encounter any issues with the site at all, please uh, contact me, and I'll I'll give you that information at the end of the end of the segment. So our next uh, piece of feedback comes from Gary, and Gary writes, Eric. Congratulations on the birth of your child. I have one of my own and know how what a profound joy it is. I'm enjoying your podcast, especially the mention of packages and functions. There are so many great functions, but they can be quite difficult to find. I liked learning about file.info and read HTML table, and I will be using them both for sure. Well, thanks a lot, Gary. And heck, that's always something I've been wanting to do with the podcast when I launch it is to highlight not only kind of the more standard things you can do with R, but also kind of the nice tricks and utilities that may not be obvious to someone new to it or someone who's used it for a long time. And a lot of these things I've found just, again, trying things out and being able to read some nice content online but yeah, file.info and read HTML table were absolutely very important as I was talking about the data munging I've had to do with that hockey data, both from that uh, hockey summary project uh, set as well as the um, hockey reference site where we actually imported it directly online via the XML package. So if you haven't listened to those episodes, I definitely invite you to go to the website and check those episodes out because I think it was It's certainly something I'm going to be doing a lot more of, and it was really my first time using those kind of utilities to import data online um, from that site, and I think I will be doing a lot more of that in the future, that's for sure. So our next feedback comes from Brock. Brock writes, Hi, thanks for putting out the podcast. What a great idea. Keep it up. Saw that you have talked a little bit about analyzing hockey data with R. Just wanted to pass along some of the work that I have done in the past. And Brock gives me a link to his site, which is a blog about NHL hockey analysis. And I've Brock, I haven't had a chance to directly reply back to you yet, but I've had a chance to check out your site, and I think you've done some really excellent work. And I definitely will be reading this a lot more as we actually start... Um, 
carry out the analysis of the NHL data we have on our GitHub page. And I really like what you've done so far. And of course, for those of us that are hockey fans, well, this is all the hockey we're getting right now is through our own research because the season still isn't going yet. Although from what I last heard, it sounds like there is progress between the players uh, union and the, and the league owners in getting an agreement. But I've heard that before and it hasn't come true. So I, I'll believe it when I see it. That's all I'll say about that. All right. Our last piece of feedback comes from Brian. And Brian writes, Hello, Eric. First of all, I just wanted to say that I enjoyed the podcast very much. I am new to R and was taking a course on statistics that uses R for some exercises. I used sudo app-get method for getting R installed, but it is not the most current release of R. Is there any way to update the, to the current 2.15.1 version without a complete reinstall of R? Thanks so much. Keep up the good work. Well, thanks a lot, Brian. And here's the good news is that what Brian is referring to is that given the command he mentioned in his, his uh, message there, he's likely using the Linux distribution Ubuntu, or perhaps it's a derivative of that like Linux Mint. But those uh, versions of Linux distributions, they let the user install these um, add-on, you know, different extensions of software via a command called app-get. They can also use a, a package manager to do it. But the bottom line is that in these distributions, as they're released, they tend to have a version of R that may not be up to date with what's currently out there. So how do you get around this? And here's the direct answer to the question. Well, the good news, uh, Brian, is that if you go on the R site, which is, of course, r-project.org, you'll want to navigate to, of course, the download page and, you know, of course, choosing a mirror that's close to you. But when you go to the Linux section, you want to pay close attention to the different distributions that are offered. And if you are using Ubuntu or one of its derivatives, go ahead and check that part of the site. So once you, once you go on that site, it'll give you some instructions for how you can update what's called your sources f list file, which basically has all these different repositories that Ubuntu will, will basically source for getting package updates. You can add the, um, your mirror of interest from CRAN into that file. For example, if I'm choosing the mirror that's say on the west coast of the US like a California mirror, I would put that line in there in that sources.list file and then I would update kind of the, um, the system with a command called sudo app-get update. And then when I want to do sudo app-get install and do r-base, you also want to do r-base-dev for when you want to compile packages, then it will tap into the most recent version of R because you're getting it directly from the CRAN mirror itself instead of the default Ubuntu repository. So the good news is that the R site has direct instructions for how to do this um, on the download Linux portion. And when you click on Ubuntu, you'll get this page. Um, you'll just want to follow those instructions and th that will take you to what you need to get to in order to get the most recent version of R on there. So that's an excellent question because as I was new to Linux and I was putting R on there, I realized that, wait a second, why is this version like two versions behind what I could get on Windows or something? Well, you just have to map to the CRAN mirror in your repository list and then you'll be all set. So let me know if you're having issues with that and I'll be glad to work with you further, but that's the easiest way to get that solved. So thanks so much for the message. And one thing before we close out the feedback segment I wanted, I wanted to mention is that in order to provide feedback to the R podcast, um, we actually now have another method on top of the methods I've already uh, talked about in previous episodes. We, of course, accept your emails at um, thercast at gmail.com. Um, that's been usually the way I get most of my feedback. 
But now you'll see that if you go to the, the home site, r-podcast.org, if you click on the contact link at the top of the page, you'll see that now we have a contact form. So all you have to do is just simply fill that out, send it on over, and I'll get that message automatically in my email. So if, you as, if you're on the site and just want to provide feedback that way, go right ahead. And um, I've already gotten some feedback from users um, using that form. So, and I may have mentioned it in a previous episode. I honestly don't remember, but that, that's another great way to provide feedback. And as I mentioned, um, we're launching this new uh, subreddit uh, functionality to kind of be a new version of the forums. But I would definitely, if you want to share your feedback there, head over to links.r-podcast.org and go ahead and submit your feedback there as well. And I'll be glad to take a look and respond to that. So this is the part I'm going to introduce a couple of new segments to the show. Um, the first segment we're calling the R Community Roundup. All right, so this is the first time I've done this kind of segment, but I've kind of done it unofficially in the past where th this segment's all meant to just highlight some of the happenings around the R community that I think are interesting and give you kind of some links to do some further research if you'd like to know more. So the first update is, of course, with R itself, because since we recorded the last episode, there has been a new uh, small update to R, where now they're on version 2.15.2. And I have, re I have read the release notes, and I'll put a link to it in the show notes. There aren't many, I would say, huge new features out, but it does fix some bugs and things like that. So I think the thing I found I took the most notice of is that because it was released very close to the, the ha Halloween day here in the United States, it was released, I believe, a week before, they called this release Trick or Treat. I thought that was just kind of funny they did that. Um, so, I'll, like I said, I'll put a link in the show notes to the release notes if you want to get some more information. The next uh, update I want to highlight is um, through the uh, powerful uh, ggplot2 visualization package that in the previous episodes we've uh, highlighted how to use that package. They've had an update to version 0.9.2.1, which on the surface may not sound like a big update, but there was actually a big, big uh, part of the package that was updated, and that is giving the user a lot more uh, functionality to customize the theme of plots. In fact, they have now a new theme system, and this is really kind of opening the doors for users to really customize all the aspects of a ggplot2 plot, not just so much the data inside and everything, but really everything surrounding the plot how the axes are styled, how the fonts are styled, you know, everything like that. And there's there's already some great uh, applications out there by users of the community, uh, members of the community, about kind of extending the theme system. And uh, one of the extensions is actually trying to mirror the popular uh, web uh, comic uh, system, XKCD, I believe is what it's called. Um, where they kind of have this really kind of cartoony kind of fun and stuff, but it's usually very, very funny. Well, now apparently because of this new theme system, a user has been able to replicate how you would do a plot using that kind of font, that kind of style. So that's, I mean, is it really critical? Well, no, but it's just really funny. So it's just really cool to kind of see the ggplot2 theme uh, updates allowing users to really mirror a lot of different techniques for styling their plots. So I'll have a link in the show notes, the kind of uh, whole page on the uh, ggplot2 wiki about the theme system. And I'll also have a link to kind of um, a post about this uh, extension of the themes to these uh, new, new applications. It's really interesting. The last part of the roundup for today is a message that came, or an update that came just recently from the RStudio team. So actually, there are a couple of things. First of which is our studio itself was updated recently to version 0 
and I believe another number afterwards, but I forgot. But this uh, this update, the biggest uh, feature it brings in is a tight integration with with functionality to build and develop our packages. And if you recall from the last episode, I mentioned that uh, uh, a few very uh, key and uh, you know very popular members of the R community, um, one of them Hadley Wickham, uh, has joined the R Studio team. Well, Hadley writes a package called Dev Tools, which makes the process of developing a package in R very easy, very logical, and it just helps you get your get your package done, so to speak. It ties a lot of things together to make you know automation a lot easier, make the process of writing documentation a lot easier, and testing your package and things like that, and just making a lot of it, nice developer type functionality within that package. So now, so now this uh, new version of our studio has basically direct hooks to using pieces from that package and also just some nice uh, functionality for the package development process like running tests on your package, launching a package from scratch, the documentation of the package. It's got some nice enhancements to the R Studio editor that make a lot of those things very seamless and very easy to do. So that was that came before what I'm really wanting to highlight here is that the R Studio team has produced a new web application. This application for R itself and it's called Shiny. Very interesting name, but it definitely is uh, catchy and easy to remember. Shiny is looking very promising. So what Shiny is, is that it's basically you, it's basically a new package in R that gives the user the capability of making, in essence, an interactive uh, HTML kind of interface for something that R will do. They have some great examples on their site, especially if you go to the tutorial section where you can see at a very basic level what you can do with this package is put on a histogram and give like a slider to 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 pinpoint how many sample how many observations you want that histogram to be produced with based on um you know the distribution that's summarizing so it's giving like a very unified way to add these kind of web forms like say a drop down menu kind of a slider going from like least to greatest, you know, text fields, things like that, and making those selections produce a result like right then and there, uh, you know, based on the what the user selects. So it's an interactive, you know, application that has R on the back end, but it's giving somebody the capability of not having to write R code to tweak the interface based on what, what they're looking for. So I think this has some excellent potential in the future for developing nice kind of web applets, if you will. Maybe they're with a visualization. Maybe they're with summarizing different variables in a data set. And that you could give this to like online, to like say a colleague in your organization, maybe a client you're doing consulting with or things like that. And actually what they have built into Shiny is a way to share these uh, applications online via the GitHub uh, repository uh, functionality using what they call GIST. Uh, GIST, G-I-S-T, is just simply one little snippet of code that you share of everybody. And you can basically give a link to that. And if the user goes ahead and sources that link inside the Shiny package, they can have that web interface running directly on their computer just like that. As long as they have the shiny package installed, that's all they need. So I think this has tremendous implications for the uh, R community itself, especially with collaboration. You know, making these visualizations that have these kind of on-demand features, or these, I should say, interfaces that have these on-demand features that may produce uh, visualizations could be really innovative. So yeah, I think Shiny could be a really innovative interface for R, and I'll put a link to that in the show notes as well.
So that concludes our, our community roundup. We're going to round out uh, this episode with a new segment called our package pick. So in this segment, I'm going to highlight a um, package I'm using in R that I, has really helped me get my work done and also make things a lot easier for me. So the, the first package we're highlighting in this segment is um, called Plyer, spelled P-L-Y-R. What is Plyer trying to do? Well, Plyer makes the whole, what we call, split, split your things up, apply something to it, and then put it all back together. It makes all that a lot easier and very intuitive to the R user. So Plyer is um, authored by, um, well, you've heard his name before, Hadley Wickham. And I've been using this package for actually a few years now, and it's really helped make things a lot easier whenever I have a situation where, okay, I have like maybe a bunch of variables in my data set. They all have some kind of measurement with it. And maybe I just want to get summary stats from it and I want to put it all back together in like a little data frame so that I can summarize it further. So Plyer has functions like what one is called a ddply, where you supply in a data frame with your data set and then you get out another data frame that has like the summary statistics, for example, that you want to calculate. So Plyer was really meant to make things traditionally in R to do this like using the apply type functions. There's like apply, L apply, S apply, T apply, those things. They're, they're powerful, don't get me wrong, but they're a little difficult to use sometimes. So Plyer tries to make that a lot easier for the user to make that customized. So I'll put a link to that in the show notes, but I'm hoping that um, the community out there listening to the R podcast, if you want to highlight a package of choice, um, I would definitely invite you to put a post in our um, new subreddit for that. And I'll be glad to you know, take your feedback as, as part of this segment for highlighting packages that make things a lot easier to do in R. So we are finally at the end of the episode. I realize this has gone a bit longer than I thought it would, but hey, it's, it's, it's great to finally be back with an episode. So I'll close by saying you can find all this episode and all of our previous episodes on our home site. That's www.r-podcast.org. You can also get our updates for when a new show, a new episode is produced. We have the show updates on our Twitter account. Our handle is at the Rcast. And you can also get show updates on our Google Plus page. And you can find a direct link to that page on, on the home site itself. And as I mentioned in previous parts of the episode, we are launching a new subreddit to kind of replace the traditional forums. And you can find that at links.r-podcast.org. And if you want to get in touch with us at the show, you can, of course, send us an email at um, thercast at gmail.com. You can also utilize our contact form at the top of our homepage by clicking the contact link. So that concludes this episode of the R Podcast. I'm really looking forward to sharing the next uh, parts of this uh, reproducible analysis series. So with that, that, that put a wrap on this episode. So until next time. End of line.